Dave Wood, welcome to Between Two Beers. Cheers. <laughs> still, we still haven't got the cans in. Nah, I haven't got the cans. It's an ongoing theme with us. A uh, little bit of a stressful morning for you with the flooding, Dave. Everything okay at your residence? Uh, to be honest, it wasn't that stressful. Uh, for some people, I live at Piha. For some people, it was pretty stressful. Uh, one of the roads down there um, where the river runs next to the road, the river uh, overflowed onto the road, and so it went to a bunch of properties. But uh, yeah, to be honest, my house was pretty good. You're also an expert in dealing with stress as well, so I don't <laughs> imagine maybe you got too stressed in that situation anyway. I was calm. <laughs> I was calm. <laughs> we'll find out more about that as we I, go through. I mean, it can't have been that bad because I, I went surfing today, and um, yeah, so <clears throat> the surf's been pumping for the last week, so I've spent an astronomical amount of time in the water. Yeah, nice. Uh, even though it's been apparently red listed um, because of the uh, rivers flowing out in the septic tanks. All oh, right, all oh, right. We won't tell anyone. Surf was pumping, so I took my chances. Yeah, <laughs> happy days. Yeah, Dave sent us a uh, a video from his place of, of it underwater outside. So we sort of cancelled the app and then we're back on. Um, but we're very excited to have. We you were in. stressed. We, we, was, we, we were stressed. Like, yeah. we, we're hoping we can learn some lessons from you on how to how to mitigate some of the stress on the uh, in the afternoon and the drive up. Yeah, well, I, I drove down one of the roads at Pihar that was flooded, and there was a council lady there, and she um, got out of car and she was running towards the van, and she was highly stressed. She was screaming and yelling at me, telling me I had to get off the road. And I was like, hey, hey, just be calm. It's all good. Yeah. <laughs> Did you I'm give her right. a calm under pressure leaflet and say, hey, maybe, maybe you should sure. come to one of these she and looked, later she on She was air. real stressed, but she looked like she needed it. I've got some skills that can help you. Um, well, we're happy to have you here in the Export Beer Garden Studio into the exports uh, before we get started. Is this part of your, your program at all? You enjoy uh, a beer to unwind? Yeah, I love beer. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say like I'm a big drinker. Uh, I used to be a binge drinker. Growing up, didn't we, like all? we all? Like didn't we, we all did. Yeah. Uh, now I just enjoy yeah one or two beers in the evening. Oh, Keep it pretty low key, like that. Okay. Um. So this is quite a, a dangerous way to start because we're going to talk about some really important, serious topics in this app, and I don't want to derail it too early. But I asked your partner Emma for a few good Dave stories uh, in preparation for this episode, and she said ask him about his sausage story. And we actually had another source say, oh, you've got to, you've got to hear his sizzler story. So oh, two boy. sources have said it's a story. We thought it might be a good place to start. Dave, what's your sausage story? I honestly don't know if you want to hear the sausage story. The last time I told the sausage story was at um, a health summit about four months ago uh, in Auckland City. And the lady before me was a nutritionist and she kept talking about sausages. So this story about the sizzler came into my head. Anyway, I got up in front of um, 400 people and the first thing I did was I told the sizzle story and it got to the punchline and no one laughed. So I was sort of just standing up there and, and I was like, I was like, oh, that, that's the end of the story. And everyone was just like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then at the, at, at the end of this conference, I went out with, um, they had a ball afterwards and I went out and um, one guy came up to me while I was standing in line waiting to get a beer and he, he just leans in and he goes, oh, I really love the sausage story. That wasn't Simon Gower, was it? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, um, we were living in Cornwall, uh, me and a bunch of mates from Piha, and um, we had a barbecue one night. We cooked up all these cheese sizzlers and um, got to the end of the barbecue, and there's one cheese sizzler left, and we we're all going to town. So I chucked it in my uh, pocket, and we ended up out in town. And, and this cheese sizzler, all night, it was like the it was like the joke, like we'd place it underneath someone's legs or up on the bar or anyway. We went on all night with this cheese sizzler, and uh, the next morning I woke up hung over and um, reached into my pocket and there was the cheese sizzler. And so we were in this little flat and I thought it would be a good idea to uh, cut a little hole in my mate's, underneath my mate's bed and slide the um, sizzler up underneath his bed. And so it stayed there for months until he started, um, until it started sort of uh, rotting and started smelling. So then he found it and then he hid it somewhere in my room. This went back and forward for about four months with this cheese, this cheese sizzler. And um, at one morning, I went, when we got into the bathroom, and it was sitting on the end of my um, electric toothbrush. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, yeah, I went back and forth for ages. And um, so I was like, oh, I'll go and hide it in his car. And so I went into his car, and um, I thought a great place to hide it would be where he wouldn't be able to find it, would be um, in the passenger, um, uh, above the passenger visor. And I thought, oh, I'll sit there for a while, and he'll, he'll, he'll never find it. And uh, he had this date with this girl and he was real nervous about, um, about this date and uh, had to go and pick this girl up. And he went, drove up the coast. We're living right on the coast in Cornwall and the road hugs the coast and he went up to the airport to pick her up. But he was real nervous. And um, so he picked this girl up and they're coming back over the um, coastal road 
and uh, as he gets over the hill, the sun shines into the car, oh, and so he pulls his visor down, <laughs> and uh, then she reaches up and pulls her visor down, and the sausage falls down and lands on her lap, <laughs> and he reckons he just he just stopped and looked at it and just couldn't believe, and and I mean, how do you explain that to the a girl that you barely know on the first date that you pull the visor down and the sausage falls in your lap. Nah, this is the whole thing that's been going on. Me and my group, nah, yeah, yeah. I think that speaks volumes to uh, the, what's the word? The uh, toughness of a sizzler, that it lasted that long as well. They're indestructible, those yeah, things. Yeah, it didn't stop there. This thing this thing went yeah for months and months and months. And um, I mean, you could bend it at, at both ends and it would touch and it was like, oh, I mean, that's not real meat, is it? It's no. like, what are, what are those things? But yeah, we're, now we just um, we always talk about the cheese. It's not. It's, when I, I told that uh, story at his um, wedding. <laughs> when did uh, when did the sizzler cease to be a thing, or is it still in circulation? Oh, who knows where it is? It'll be amazing. It'll turn up in the mail one yeah, day. He's probably just... kept it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's a good start. It's I mean, a great you, start. Yeah, you got. We got the punchline. We yeah. got the laughs. Yeah. I've done, we've, we did the same. Just to jump in there, we did the same thing. It was send a sausage. It's actually a genuine thing, and I got sent one at work at my old work, and I just couldn't work out who'd sent me the sausage. And we started the exact same thing, and I actually hid it in Marcus Logan's car in the uh, in the glove box, and it stayed there sweltering over summer until... Uh, so was he, it? So he, it was, uh, I, I think it was, a, it was a non-described sausage, but I think if you were to take it out of the packet, it was definitely sizzler material. <laughs> yeah, nice. All right, strong start. All right, we've got a, a bit of a plan for the set, Dave, and we're going to end with all the amazing stuff you're doing with the biggest names in the game. But... I think just as interesting is how you got there. And I'm going to start painting the picture and then get you to take over. So you grew up in Piha, went to Auckland Grammar School, big into your surfing and skating, became a lifeguard, which was your job for 12 years. Then you come back to New Zealand at 28 and use that practical experience to get into health science at uni and seg that into working as an intensive care paramedic for St. John's. Now, that seems like a, a pretty interesting ride, but what's the most interesting part of that journey? Um, <clears throat> I think I think the whole journey has been, uh, for me, has been hugely challenging, even going back to school, going to Auckland Grammar. Um, I was in, I was in, I remember going to, <clears throat> starting in third form and being in the hall and they, they work on a tier system from A, uh, all oh, the way yeah. down, and um, and so if you're sm the smartest kids are an A, and then so you're in this hall on the first day, which is like uh, I mean that's scary for any kid uh, the first day at high school, and they're reading out the people in A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and I was sitting there thinking, you know, my name will get read out pretty soon, and then I look around, there's only a few people left in the hall, and uh, they called out L, and I was in class L, and it went down to M. And I remember going back home at the end of the day and the old man was like, oh, what class are you in? And I said, oh, you know, very reluctantly said L. And he was like, L, M, N, O, P, Q. Well, it's about halfway. And I said, oh, it goes down to M. And, and so um, from that sort of point on, ha having been sort of, um, sort of put into that class, I never really tried at school because in my mind I was just like, well, I'm not academic because I'm in this, you know, L, so why try? That was my mindset. Were you um, a sporty kid? Dave? I was. I played. Yeah, played a lot of <coughs> tennis, but um, I just wanted to be surfing. Like at that age, sort of 13, 14, 15, 16, I'd really got into my surfing, and I just, I just wanted to be out surfing. That wasn't so. If you weren't academic at that school, or you weren't, uh, you know, playing uh, soccer, rugby, sort of, uh, it could. It was a bit of a struggle. So um, yeah, that sort of set me up. That's why I never went to university after school because I thought, well. You have to be academic to to go to university, and um, that became like a big challenge for me later in life. Going back uh, to university, and it was actually in my first year of university, getting picked up by one of the lecturers who um, uh, told me that I had like some form of dyslexia, and uh, she sent me off to um, like there was a uh, you could go to this place in the university where they would assess you, and they said to me, "Look, you're you're very good at like um, you're more visual, so for your exams if you can draw diagrams so I was getting like C's and D's and and f sort of flunking in that first year as soon as I started drawing diagrams I was getting A pluses A's and A pluses and I, and I went right through the, the degree like that and the diagrams I could draw were incredibly intricate and that's when I realized far out man I'm actually um, you know, I'm actually really smart it's just that that is the way that I'm like a very visual and with diagrams and stuff you shared with us as well that you're, you're deaf in one ear was that through 
high school as well when you kind of discovered that? Yeah, that was like when I was like three or four, um, yeah, fully deaf in my right ear. Uh, and to be honest, like now, it's, just, it's kind of like normal, you know, but in, in like social settings when there's a lot of like background noise, it's difficult. Yeah, right. Um, Which I could imagine as a, as a teenage kid in a big school like Auckland Grammar, that must have played in your mind as that well. That never really phased me. Oh, like, right. like coming through school, that never really phased me. What what phased me at school was just like um, being in that class and, and, and thinking that I wasn't um, smart and, and, and so not trying. Um, that's what like uh, st- stuck with me like for a long time. It wasn't until, like I said, like I went back to university and realised like actually I'm academic and... I can smash this stuff. So, did, did you stick to? Did you stick at high school all the way through to seventh form? Uh, I left in sixth form. I failed fifth. I, I did fifth form maths and got forty eight percent. Yep. And then I went back another year. So I went on to sixth form, but I did fifth form maths again. And the old man got me a tutor, and so I'd have this tutor come to the house two times a week. And so I went back and reset it and got forty four percent. Because I was just by that stage, I was just didn't want to know about it, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I always just think what a what a hell of a way to like. Um, sort of categorise people in terms of their, um, you know, intellectually into, into like an A, B, C, D. Yeah, especially yeah. at such a young, impressionable age as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and I know that like the kids in my class were the same. We just, we just didn't try. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's such an important discovery to make, which mm. we're going to get into you know, where it's led you. But the path, so 12 years as a lifeguard and it was an exchange program. You spent some time in England. Yeah, so I, uh, I finished school and then um, I was always lifeguarding, always like a volunteer lifeguard out at Piha. And then I got into the paid lifeguarding, which um, which is like three four, three months of the year in New Zealand. And I was the patrol captain at Piha Beach, which is like Piha Beach, the west coast of New Zealand is, um, I mean, I've travelled all over the world and, and that coast is so raw and, um, and Piha Beach is like, uh, I mean, it's a dangerous beach if you don't know what you're doing. And so lifeguarding there, I picked up a lot of um, like the practical school skills relating to stress and pressure and being able to operate in those environments. And um, I then got accepted to go over to Cornwall on the New Zealand Lifeguard Exchange uh, after lifeguarding here for three, four years. And so I went over there, I got a British passport and I ended up staying over there uh, for uh, eight, nine years. Um, uh, I lifeguarded like for four years in, in Cornwall on the beaches there uh, and I'd pick up odd jobs and my whole thing was just travelling like at that time in my life I really just wanted to challenge myself and growing up my old man would always tell me these stories about his travels he, he um, hitchhiked through the Middle East and you know he did things like with his travels that just blew me away and so from a young age hearing those stories I was like I want to go to these countries and I want to explore and I want to challenge myself and I want to go on a holiday I want to travel and i and the whole idea for me about travelling was going to these countries and getting as far away from uh, the tourist attractions as possible and like really putting myself in uncomfortable situations. And, and I just thrived on that. I loved um, that aspect of uh, travelling. Yeah, I think this is a good part. Um, look, to try to explain what's happening here, we've got someone who's at the very forefront, the very top of their game, but in order to, to be able to speak with such authority on it, you have to have put yourself through a number of stressful and sticky situations. And and talking to Emma, she said the whole uh, calm under pressure thing is quite funny because of the number of sticky situations you've got yourself in over the years. So I was hoping we could actually talk about a few of these now. And she said one of them, which really grabbed my attention, was the time in Bali when you were left out at sea. And oh, when you when you start bringing this stuff up, I'm like, oh, God, what, what did she yeah. say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um... Uh, that, that particular time, uh, yeah, I was surfed. We was, I took Emma over to Bali because uh, that's like a place like growing up that it's like the mecca of surfing is going to Bali because there's so many good waves and um, there's one way that you need to get a boat out to. It's called airports and the boat drops you out there. And so I got dropped out in the evening and um, it's quite a way out to sea. It's called airports because um, it's right next to the runway for the airport. Um and so this boat drops you out and they come back and pick you up. So I went for the Arvo surf and the boat came back and it was doing the rounds and picking everyone up and I was at the far, furthest break out. And um, so you can you, you can see the beach and the huts and everything, but it's, it really is in the distance, like you're, you're quite a way out to sea. 
And uh, and then I watched the boat disappear, and then I watched them pulling the boat up onto the beach, and the sun had gone down. I was like, they're going to come and get me. It's, uh, it's all good. They're going to come and get me. And then um, are you still surfing, or are you just floating at that stage? No, at this stage, I'm like far out. I'd, <laughs> why are they pulling the boats up, and what, why is no one coming back to get me? And so, that. at that point, <clears throat> once the sun had gone down and it started to get dark, I was like, well, I'm, I'm paddling back in, and that was all good. Like, I, I don't know how far it is. You know, like four or five k's out, and but the tide was going out, and what happens on these reefs is, is you have these channels that you've got to paddle back in through. So you've got the reef and then the channel, and when the tide goes out, all that water, we're talking you know, hundreds, uh, millions of tonnes of water moving through these um, reef passes. And so I started paddling, and um, you know, you'd stop and sit on your board, and you'd get pushed back 50 feet. And so um, I got in at like 11 o'clock at night from paddling. Pitch black? Pitch black. And um, my armpits were red, raw. And obviously Emma was like stressed out wondering where I was. But one thing about like surfing in New Zealand is that we are the best paddlers in the world for sure. For sure. Like at Piha, that's all we do is paddle and duck dive waves. There's nothing else like it. I've been all, all surfing all around the world. And on the, on the west coast of New Zealand, we do a lot of paddling because the rips are so... Um, you know, so big and there's so much current and um, it's just the way that the coast is set up here you, you, and when you're surfing here you do a lot of paddling so uh, I guess that put me in good stead and uh, just, yeah, you, you know, like I, I think if you hadn't have been a good paddler you could have easily, uh, yeah, got fatigued and got sucked out to sea and <laughs> Yeah, water in the middle of the night is like my biggest fear possible Yeah, we well, used to think of sharks and Well, straight away, that's what I'm thinking are you panicking at all during that during that phase? Are you no that that like things like that don't make me panic. It's just like that um, you know determination to like get in or um, yeah it's, t- it's just like I just viewed it as a challenge really. And I went back the next day and I said to the guys like I was pissed off like yeah I mean you, I, it, it took me hours to paddle in right and um, so I went back down there the next day and I was telling this Indonesian guy about how he left me out there and, um, you know, like he apologised. I was like, man, I could have drowned. Like, And then I, I was like, well, I'm going back out again. And uh, so he had the audacity to try and charge me and take me back out oh. again. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, mate. <laughs> yeah. um, what part of this journey, of your journey was this? Because, I mean, you teach stress mitigation and calm under pressure now, but was this when you were still a lifeguard? And were there things now reflecting on it that you were doing that you now teach? Yeah, I think like you, you for, for what I'm doing, uh, stress mitigation and calm under pressure. You you have to understand like the underlying theory of um, you know how stress affects you physically and mentally. But to be honest, like it is all these practical experiences. I, I, I've learnt so much from those nine, ten years of travelling. I went overseas. I worked for Club Med um, in Malaysia and Indonesia. Uh, I, I did the lifeguarding in Cornwall. We bought me and my mate bought a van. We went from England all the way down to the bottom of Morocco. I uh, taught English in South America, and and in all of these places, it, for me, it was just everything was about like putting myself into a challenging situation. Um, and so, yeah, I, I learned so much from those travels and, and just practical experiences of life that I now apply into um, the training because I always think like. You can't train someone in stress mitigation or calm under pressure unless you have really been put under the pump and you have those practical experiences. So those practical experiences are right through my life, not only with travelling but just growing up at Pihar. And, you know, we grew up in an environment that was like, um, it was really just a bunch of boys surfing and if you put your head up, you got pushed back down and we were always trying to prove ourselves. You know, it wasn't proving yourself by by putting your head up and telling everyone how good you were. You just didn't do that. We proved ourselves by like going surfing or how many beers can you drink or you know it was all just yeah. uh, kid stuff. But it was like a, an environment out there that was very much like um, you know very close knit group of friends and we're all pushing each other. Uh, yeah, and I was sort of like one of the youngest in that group, so it was uh, you know even more so trying to trying to push yourself up to the top. The other story that we need to hear about, and I asked Dave before the episode if he could send me through any pics or info about you know great experiences he's had. 
And there was one, and it's the Andaman Islands. Yeah, and is. he lived in a lighthouse for three months off the Indian coast. And I was talking to Shay on the way up, and he was he did a quick Google search of it, right? Andaman Islands is where the guys got killed. Yeah, I was like, is that where the American tourists, there's a, like a, a, a tribe of people that like no outside contact, and they tried to get on shore and they killed them, right? Yeah, so it's a, it's a very interesting place. Um, when I was working in Cornwall, I lifeguarded with a guy called Neil. He was, uh, he's quite a bit older than me, and he was mad. He was crazy. This guy was a real traveller. Like he'd spent his whole life, he would, he would work six months of the year, five months of the year lifeguarding, and the rest of the time he was away travelling. And he said to me, we worked in the same, at the same beach, and um, we would talk a lot about our travels, and he'd tell me all about these places that he'd been, and he was like, look, there's this island, uh, this chain of islands, the Andaman Islands, in the Bay of Benegal, and... Um, it's been closed to tourism for the last 10 years because America have strategic strongholds in these islands where they can fire into the Middle East. So it's been, you, you couldn't go there. And he said, look, it's just opening up and there's this island that I've, you know, Google, Google Earth that he searched because he's always trying to find these um, waves in the most remote, like crazy places. And he's like, look, there's this island that was like um, really affected from the tsunami. And at the very tip of this island is a, um, is a lighthouse. And it's, this is just dense, like, forest. Like, there's no road to this lighthouse. There's one uh, little town on this island called Hut Bay. Um, and when they had the tsunami in this little um, town, I don't know, there's, like, 200 people that live there. They're all, like, farmers and that. Um, this, they have saltwater crocs. And so when the tsunami happened, these saltwater got, crops got washed into the crop fields. And when the, the tsunami resided, they went to the crop fields to try and save the crops. They got bitten by the crocs. And so in this one little village on this Andaman Island, Hut Bay, there's all these people uh, with that are amputees, right? And so oh. we're walking around just going, man, it looks like everyone's got like one leg or, or one arm. And so we asked about it and they told us the story. It was incredible. But um, yeah, he, so we went to this island and we got there and we we're in this Hut Bay. And so we had this idea to get to this lighthouse. And so we started asking people, and everyone was just like, no, you can't get there. There's, all the roads have been washed away. There's no way of getting there. And plus it's all like um, there was a tribe living on this island, the Ongi tribe, and they have no real contact with the outside world. And so you've got to be careful. And, um, and we met this one guy after a week of trying to get to this, uh, the tip of this island who said he'd drop us out there in a boat. So we got all our food and water supplies and everything, and um, we took this uh, about an eight-hour boat trip in this little dinghy and uh, we couldn't get close to the uh, lighthouse because of the waves breaking on the reef so we had to dock in about three k's before the lighthouse and then just ferry all our water and food along anyway we got to the lighthouse and it had significant structural damage from the tsunami so when you stood at the bottom and you looked up it was leaning over to one side and I'm like this is like mad like <laughs> but yeah we went into the lighthouse walked up the 300 or what ever steps there were up to the top and it used to have a big like light dome on top that was smashed and all the glass was on the top and anyway that's where we lived at the top of this lighthouse for a month um, with enough you know just basic food supplies and there was coconuts there and uh, we could catch fish and the view out from this um, because we we stayed up the very top of the lighthouse and I've got pictures of, of us sleeping up there. I've seen that pack, what one sur- uh, sleeping on like a surfboard cover, it looked yeah. like, as a blanket. Yeah, and, and those were the best sleeps I've ever had in my life. I always look back to that time, and it was like the deepest, best sleeps I've ever had. And the reason behind that was it was dark at 5 o'clock, and we had no light. You know, like once it was dark, it was like 6.30, 7 o'clock, we were in bed asleep, you know. And so we, our, our circadian rhythm, our, our, that central clock just clicked into those rhythms of, you know, when the sun went down, we got sleepy. When it come up, we wake up, and... And so I was having these real incredible sleeps for the month that I was there. And I had so much energy. And just out the front, when you looked out, because it was right on the um, beach, when you looked out, within about, um, you know, two, three k's either side, there's about five, uh, I shouldn't, he's always told me not to tell anyone, but there's, you know, perfect surf breaks. And so we were the only ones there. No one else there went to see another soul for that um, month that we were out there. Uh, and then they come back and picked us up, and uh, we came back to Hut Bay, got a whole lot more provisions, then we went back out again. Um, and it's just one of those times in my life that, um, that that was like the actual, when you talk about freedom and just being free, that was it. And um, this guy, Neil, he was so, he's just so um, far out there. He, he, 
we were getting all these good waves right out in front of the lighthouse, but he could see in the far distance this point, and he was like, we got to get to that point, and he became fixated on it. You could barely see it. And I was like, man, we don't have, like, that's that's at least a day walk, and, you know, like, we've got to take water and food, and what are we going to do when we get there? Because he was convinced that there was a wave there. And so it became this, like, real thing of contention where he wanted to me to go with him and I didn't want to go I was happy just being there and surfing these waves out front and he got real angry about it and it ended up like a real confrontation so one day I was like all right let's go and so we set off at about um, five o'clock in the morning and it must have taken us probably about eight hours to walk to this point oh, and then we got there went for a swim and we walked back again <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like but he loved it he was just in his element you know like that was and actually what ended up happening is um because we went out there and we could see there was a reef past there and there'd be a wave there, we, we came back again and he was still fixated on going back and I was like, I'm not going. So he left and he went out there by himself and I stayed in the lighthouse. Oh. So, yeah, <laughs> it was mad. Were, were you a young man with no fear? Like you say, this is a wobbly-looking lighthouse and you climb to the top and you go out in these crocodile-infested waters and you go into this remote island. Like, did you not have fear? No, I had um, definitely had fear growing up. I had like a um, irrational fear of the ocean. Growing up as a kid, like I was really scared of of like bigger waves to the point that you know when I was sort of like 12, 13, um, all the boys there's this there's this spot we surf at Piha called the Cove, and once you finish surfing in the Cove, you would paddle over to the middle to come in. Well, I was always too scared to paddle over to the middle, so I'd come into this little beach and walk over the rocks, and all the boys would just give you grief all day, you know, and um, because out there it was very much about proving yourself in the ocean and, and, and surfing big waves and. I was terrified of that, um, but I always had my parents always gave me the freedom growing up to do what I wanted to do more or less. You know, obviously I had rules and that, but I think that freedom of being able to explore out there and growing up out there gave me the confidence. Um, and now, you know, like I love surfing big waves, and but I, I have fear about all sorts of things for sure. But I'm, that fear is good, you know, if it's controlled. Um, that's what keeps you safe, right? Yeah. You, you spoke about, are um, oh, you going to hang around in here? Yeah, yeah, I just had one more question. Because yeah, we, we did Google search the Andaman Islands and someone was killed going there. Was there any, yeah. any trouble with the people, like did the interactions you had with the people there? Were no, there a the, threat? the island we were on, the Ongi tribe, um, they've had little contact with the outside world, but they started coming into this. Once they um, set up in this hut bay, because the, uh, the Indian people set up in this hut bay and they built shops and there's actually ended up being a liquor shop in this little oh. village and you can see how it's just the decimated. Root, the root of all evil. Yeah, it's just decimated the place. Um, and what, what started happening is the Ongi tribe would come into the village to get sugar and butter and chips and, and all the rest of it and that caused all, all sorts of, as you can imagine, all sorts of problems because they started, you know, those tribes, if they get something like the flu, they're not immune to um, you know, they haven't been exposed to um, th that level of... Uh, and so, yeah, there is an um, island and it's the last known human population that has had no contact, zero contact with the outside world and it's an island called uh, North Sentinel Island and they are called the Sentinelese. And after the um, Boxing Day tsunami, because um, it's only a small island and you can't, when you go Google... Uh, is it called Google Earth? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, you can't see because it's just dense forest, right? So, that, so there's no real way of telling like how many of these people were wiped out. So they tried to land a um, helicopter on the island and they came out and, and shot um, arrows at the helicopter. Yeah. And then so there's this one guy that, because um, it is patrolled by uh, the army, so there's now like you can't even get close to the island. Yeah. But I don't know what this guy managed to um, get himself on the beach at this island and they um and this is all documented they um they caught him tied him up and um yeah yeah killed him, <laughs> killed him yeah killed him. so you don't land on that island and um there's like footage of it as well right like you can see him yeah on the yeah beach. you can yeah and um obviously such a stupid thing to do because you go on that island you take uh i mean they don't have the immunity to deal with like the common flu or things that like you would take to an island like that um so yeah and and we sailed right past that island and I, i'd read the book about it and and so yeah it was fascinating um just being there um but yeah I, I, one of the countries i enjoyed most was india 
um, because we left to go out to this Andaman Island from Chennai. And I arrived uh, a couple of months earlier and went through um, India by myself. And um, I was reading this book, Shantaram, at the time. I don't know if you've read the book. Uh, but Shantaram is an incredible book uh, based on a true story. And it's all based in India and Mumbai. And so I was reading this book. And it, when I was reading the book, they would talk about these different places in Mumbai. And so I'd get on a, a bus and go to that place that I was reading the book. And I'd sit down in the cafe they were talking about. And so it was... Um, uh, India is such an incredible place and um, probably one of like the best or, or the most memorable travel stories I have is probably the most uncomfortable and that was um, a seven-day um, camel track in the Thar Desert and I, I was just travelling through India and I got up to Rajasthan and I met this French guy, this elderly French guy and he was telling me about how you had to go out and do this camel track, right? And you can, it's like quite a touristy thing, you can go out, spend a night, um, with a group of people in the Thar Desert and then you go back and that's it, you've ticked it off. And he's like, don't do that. You've got to go for like at least a week, if not a couple of weeks, right? And he, so he gave me all the information, um, went to this place, Bikaneer, uh, met up with his family, spent the night there. They drove me out to meet up with the, um, uh, the camel guy and it was just a camel and the camel cart. And he didn't speak any English. <laughs> that was my first question yeah. was going to be like, <laughs> English? I mean, I, I was so like just naive. Like I didn't even, when I how, went to these countries, I, I wouldn't even know anything about them. I'd just turn up and... How old, how old are you in this kind of... I was like 24, phase of your life. 24 when yeah. I was in India. Carefree. Yeah. yeah. And and um, yes, yeah, so I met up with the camel and, and I thought, oh, this is going to be amazing. I had all these images of, you know, going through the Thar Desert and how incredible it was. Well, about two hours in, it was about 45 degrees and I was sitting on the back of this camel car <laughs> and I could walk faster than the camel car and it was just sand and shrubs and it was like, on the second day I got heat stroke. I was just like chronically dehydrated and all we had to eat was chapati bread, rice and potatoes and you could not talk to the guy. So I would get off and I would walk ahead of the camel car um, for hours and, and you'd just be plodding through the desert and then... You know, every every sort of couple of days, you'd come across a small village, and he'd park up and go and chat with his mates. And um, fascinating at night time there, it would be so it'd be like forty five degrees during the day, but at night time it's freezing cold. And he would sleep up on the um, camel car, and I'd be on the ground on the on the sand. And they have these um, sand beetles, which are these big black beetles. They're massive, and they only come out at night. And so I was lying there on the first night, and they they these sand beetles are like crawling all over you and in your sleeping bag and the first couple of nights I was, I was up all night just trying to get you know because they would be in your hair and everywhere and then after that it was just you know just let them crawl all over you <laughs> but the reason why like that's the most memorable um experience for me in all of my traveling is because it was so uncomfortable I remember getting into like the third or fourth day and I was telling this guy because he wouldn't help he wouldn't let me help with any of the food prep or like with the camel or anything like that he didn't want to talk to me and so um at about th day three or four, I was trying to explain to him that I wanted to go back. And so I was drawing these diagrams, take us back to the road, and, and he just yeah, wouldn't... Was he aggressive or just... No, not at all. But he just, um, just not didn't want to talk um, and, you know, trying to explain to him to take me back. He didn't understand any of that. Um, but we spent one night up on this... Um, up on the sand dune, and it was like you could see like 360 degrees, and for f as far as you could see was just sand. And it was like just incredible, like just the silence. And, and so those were times that like really resonate with me in terms of like, again, like that total, like you're just out there, right? And yeah. you're really out there. And um, I remember we woke up one morning and the, um, when you're in the desert, like you're looking for as far as you can see and it looks flat, but actually it's undulating, right? And the camel had gone. <laughs> and so, and he was pan he was running around panicking, and I was just like, "Oh my God, we're in the middle of the Thar Desert, and the sun was coming up, so it's as hot as all hell." And so, he he was panicking, and he started walking off to find the camel. And so, I sat there with the you know the camel cart and that, um, and he was gone for like two hours, and I couldn't see him either because it was undulating. And but the camel had wandered off and was just it was just sitting in one of the bottom of these, um, you know, and you couldn't see it. But I was sitting there thinking, fuck, like, this, what do I do? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just out there. But after that trip, I remember, like, he dropped me back at the road after, like, I think it was eight, nine days. And um, I got the bus back to Bikaneer. And the first thing I did was I went to the um, shop and got a Coke. And I, I didn't eat potatoes for, like, a whole year. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, these stories are amazing. Like, it's so cool 
hearing about this mid 20s guy toughing it out and the shit you put yourself through because it, of the base it's going to provide for what we talk about later um there's one more part of the travel journey i want to touch on i don't know if you've got any good stories to come of it venezuela were well, there some travel hardships there which 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 really sort of helped i don't know create a, a storyboard for for your life yeah venezuela um of all the countries i've been to was one of my favorite places and I went to Venezuela from England. I was working for a company called the Admiral Crichton that do all the um, this uh, functions for the royal family. So I got to work, I got to meet you know Charles and all the royal family, and we we worked in the um, just slide uh, that into conversation. Yeah, we yeah, worked I just at met the king. like Buckingham Palace and did all the charity events. And um, I'll never forget I was out the back slicing salmon, and um, Charles came up to me and he said, "Oh, he, we got told to call him Your Royal Highness," and so he comes up to me and. Um, I just thought that was, you know, <laughs> because actually I, I've met him a few times and it's just like talking to one of the boys. He's so approachable. But he said to me, oh, where's that salmon from? And um, I was like, oh, Ireland. And I didn't know where it was from. He's like, oh, wonderful. And um, where are you? you're a Kiwi. And I was like, yeah, I'm from Pierre. And he's like, oh, I know where Pierre is. And he had a bit of a yarn. But, um, yes, yeah, so I was working for this company, Admiral Crichton, to make enough money to go to South America to do this travel through South America to go from Venezuela down through Colombia, Ecuador, Peru. And I arrived and, and, and I was really like nervous about going. I didn't speak any Spanish, hadn't learned any, and I was flying into Caracas, which is um, the main airport in Venezuela. It's also the murder capital of the world, I think. Yeah, it's a dangerous city. And you feel Good that. Eh? Yeah, <laughs> you feel that when you're there for sure. Uh, and so I arrived there, flew Lufthansa, which I'll never fly again. Um, yeah, they are shit. Yeah. They are shit. And so I was waiting at the conveyor belt, and this guy, Luizio, comes up to me, and he said, oh, you missed the wood. And I was like, yeah, and he's, well, your luggage hasn't turned up. We're going to put you up in this uh, place near the airport, which was the dodgiest place I've ever stayed in my life. Like, no tourist at all. You would never go there uh, on the outskirts of Caracas. And um, so I spent the night there. And I remember very vividly coming out of the place that I was staying and there was a dead body on the street in front of the place that I was staying. I remember seeing that and just being like, wow. Um, and so I went back to the airport, um, still hadn't found the luggage. This went on for seven days. So for seven days, I stayed in this little uh, village right on the um, coast near Caracas Airport. Every day I'd get in the bus, not speaking any Spanish, and go to the airport. And when you're traveling and you're by yourself and you're young, your possessions are everything. They mean absolutely everything. You know, I had my photos in there, my clothes. I had, you know, all these things that are like, that's your backpack is like everything. And I had my um, three, uh, two surfboards that I um, took and all the wet weather gear for tramping and all the rest of it. And on the seventh day, I remember going in and uh, he was looking at my thing on the computer and I was just so angry. I turned the computer around and they weren't even looking at my thing. They didn't have a clue where it was. And so at that point I was like, Right, I went back to this dodgy little town, little uh, village that I was staying in, and I was like, oh, I've got to get out of here. This is just, I felt so uncomfortable. It was almost like I just wanted to be back at Piha at that moment and that time. I just felt so out of place. Um, I remember going to a restaurant or, or this uh, little eatery on the um, beach, and um, the waiter come out with the menu, and I was looking at it and couldn't read any of it, so I didn't know you know, what to order. And I was just pointing at this thing and he was getting angry and I just kept pointing that one, that one. Uh, no, I was Spaniel, I just kept pointing, pointing. And anyway, he came out about 10 minutes later with um, enough bread for a family. <laughs> 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 so it's just like, well, at, at that point I was like, right, I'm going to learn Spanish. But, and that, I remember ringing my old man and saying, I, I've got to get out of here, I've got nothing, I'm, I'm feeling, you know, I didn't say it like this, but I just wanted to get either back to England or back to New Zealand. He's like, well, well why are you some money and get, get you out of there? Just just get out of there. And, um, but he did say something. He was like, we, we can sort it out and get you out of there, but just sleep on it and just see how you feel tomorrow. And, and for me, that was just like, what he was actually saying was you know, just harden up and, and keep pushing. And um, so I spent the night and woke up the next morning and that was when, when I was like, I remembered the stories, you know, that he'd told me about all his hardships and travel. And I was like, man, this is all part of it. And I went from there, um, I went to a place called Henry Pateer National Park, which is um, on the Caribbean, uh, this park that borders the Caribbean coast. And I ended up at this, I don't know how, but I ended up at this eco lodge and I had nothing. I just had what I'd been on the plane with in my backpack, so my shorts and my t-shirt. I think I bought some sandals and another couple of tees. And... Um, 
I found this eco lodge and I don't know why I went there but it was owned by this German guy and I turned up there and told him about what had happened and he said well we're painting the eco lodge can you paint and I was like oh yeah I've done lots of painting uh, and so he paid me to help them paint this eco lodge and after a week of painting the eco lodge um, there was a girl that worked there um, Cynthia I called her Pocahontas she was like long black hair this Venezuelan girl and I was just I thought she was like and so I asked her if she'd teach me um, Spanish and that's how I got to know her and I ended up staying with her um, in Venezuela and traveling all around Venezuela with her uh, and at the same time while I was working in this um, painting this lodge this guy um, Rudy Pascal the bug man have you heard of him oh, yeah no. he's a Kiwi guy yeah well, him and his crew turned up there and they were following the migration of insects from um, and the birds from Venezuela right down to the bottom uh, of Argentina, this migration that happens. Really? And he was explaining it to me and he was like, well, we need an extra guy to hold gear in that. So, if, you know, have you got a, um, three, four days and you can come with us? And I was like, yes, yeah. so I ended up in this Henry Pitea National Park to seeing all these incredible things and learning all this stuff off, um, off him and, like, just, yeah, it was... Uh, but what it taught me, like all those travels, what it taught me is like just perseverance and like, you know, things can get really uncomfortable, but you can always like, there's always a way rather than like, you can always just, we're so adverse to discomfort, right? Like, especially nowadays. Um, and I think that that's what that, that travel taught me was like, it's okay to be uncomfortable and, and feel like uh, you're a million miles from nowhere. And, um, but you, you, if you just keep going, you'll find like, Things that would get put in, and you know, would never met that girl, and um, yeah, yeah, I would never have had those experiences. And I ended up going right through Venezuela, um, right through Colombia when Colombia had been um, red zone, so you weren't allowed, to, you weren't supposed to travel there because there was such a, um, a a big thing going on at the time where the government was trying to push the FARC over the border and into Ecuador. The internal conflict that's going on there, um, which has like devastated that country. And we were there, like at a, at a re or I was there at a really um, hostile sort of time, and so there were no tourists there. And and the Colombian people, and I was really nervous about being there. But the Colombian people were the friendliest people that I've ever come across. And you wouldn't even, because one of the rules I had when I was travelling is to never stay in a backpackers. Um, and and I learned that from Neil. Like he said to me, you know, you never stay in a backpackers because you get comfortable because it's easy to be around, mm. um, and and you want to go to these places and find like families to stay with and in Colombia it was like every family would invite you in mm. um, but Colombia was just a mad it's just a mad trip some the great lessons there in perseverance like you said but also what incredible stories to have to be able to tell mm. and reflect back on like you go through shit but like th those are mo some of the most <coughs> epic stories we've ever had on this podcast <laughs> I've um, I'm literally kept yeah, yeah. Like, off every word. I'm gonna I'm gonna steer us back because there's two mm pretty incredible transitions that I can see in your life uh, from work and one of them is what we'll talk about later but the other one is from lifeguard to intensive care paramedic mm. so how did you uh, how did that journey happen mm. so the whole time that I was overseas the, the idea was because lifeguarding doesn't pay any money you're just getting getting by from day to day and enough money to go traveling and that was cool you know do that for like eight nine years but the idea was to come back, and I told the old man, you know, I'll come back to New Zealand with enough uh, pounds to, um, you know, buy a house or, or put some money down and get a house. And so that was the plan. And he was always sort of asking me about it. And I was like, probably exaggerating how much savings I had because I had nothing. But right, it was time to go to London and make some money. And uh, so I went to London and um, I worked for a company that puts up. Uh, marquees all around England so the idea was to do that and save a bunch of money um, and I did that for like four or five months and then I used that money to go surfing and um, my last trip before I came home was to go surfing around Indonesia and um, I didn't make that much money and I used that money for that and I came back to New Zealand um, and the old man picked me up from the airport and driving out to the beach he started talking about you know, buying this property, and um, I said, Tom, I've got 10 US dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went back out to pee under the lifeguard season. I was like 29, 30, I was 30, and I was just, all my mates were married, uh, you know, having kids, and I was like, what are we doing tonight? It's a, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday night, we'll meet at the pub, and, and they were like, what are you talking about? It's like, you know, midweek. Because yeah. um, in England, that's what you do, right? It's like, um, 
and so yeah, I, I, I just ended up in this weird place where like every everyone that I sort of grew up with had sort of moved on a little bit, and I was um, at a bit of loss what to do, and I was walking down the beach to go for a surf, and I bumped into my mate, and he was telling me about this paramedic degree, and um, I was like, oh, what's it all about? And he's like, well, you can become a paramedic. I didn't even know really what that was. He was explaining it to me. And he said, oh, yeah, you get you do two day shifts, two night shifts, and then you get four days off. And straight away, <laughs> I was just like, man, that sounds amazing. Oh, and you get paid all right money. And I was like, so the next day I enrolled in that. And I'm, I was a late, late at enrolling, so I started um, university, a degree in health science, um, about three weeks after, f- you know. And, and, yeah, that was like three years of the degree. Um, and then I was out on the road uh, working as a paramedic. And then over 11 years, I worked my way up to intensive care paramedic, uh, worked on a first response jeep in Auckland Central. Um, and nowadays, that job is like taking the resus room from a hospital out into the community. So we have a broad scope of practice. Uh, you can sedate people, intubate people. Um, they have ventilators. It's really pretty pretty full-on job. And you are exposed to, like I look back, I work still work part-time. Um, I'm a, have a casual contract, so I might do a shift a month. Um, but I look back at my experience of that 10, 11 years and in the university, you don't get taught. I mean, you, you get taught about health science and pathophysiology and pharmacology and uh, respiratory physiology and all these things to do with the human body and nothing about stress and pressure. And so these kids now, these are like 20, 21 year old kids that are ending up out on the road being exposed to things that man, I don't know how they do it because when I was 21, 20, oh, there's no way I could do what these kids are going out on the road and, and seeing and being you know, repetitively confronted with um, over and over again because it has um, the burnout rate in that job is pretty high. Like I think it's like three to four years. What's an example of pressure you're talking about? You're talk, talking about like highly emotive scenes where, um, I mean, you, you imagine anything that can happen to human beings and you see it in that job um, from mental health, suicide, uh, you know, tragic things that happen, happen with kids, um, traumatic events, uh, medical events, you're exposed to all of it. And um, it can become like, for me in that job, it was never like one job or one thing. It's just the repetitive, um, you end up becoming like sensitised to it. Uh, and you can end up, you end up becoming, well, I did quite cynical about human beings because you're constantly dealing with people that are unwell, um, a small percentage of which, you know, are... Um, not self-inflicted, but a large percentage of that is just self-inflicted unwellness from not looking after yourself. Yeah, and and um, that job taught me a lot about like how I want to look when I'm 50, 60, 70, and I want to be high functioning. I want to be surfing. I want to be healthy because of what I've seen in that job is the effects of being trapped in your body for the last uh, 20, 30 years of your life. And in New Zealand, we've got a massive problem with. Um, uh, lifestyle disease, high blood pressure, um, obesity, cardiovascular disease, cerebral vascular disease, um, and the w- the way that we like deal with this problem is just to medicate it. And um, you know, I've I've got mates that are in their forties that are on high high blood pressure medication, and yeah, we're like, I don't think we're like a very well uh, nation. We've got the people that are like. The five percent that are really healthy, or the ten percent that are really healthy, uh, and then we've got the people that are really unhealthy, and we still got the people in the middle that don't really care either way. <laughs> so, so, eleven years as an intensive care paramedic, you're you're obviously learning and training yourself and figuring the shit out as you go. Towards the end, are you starting to think about what's next? Like, is the is it the mental toll that it's taken on you, or is it that you see? the experience and skills you've learned could be used in the sport field? Like, where does this transition start coming in? Yeah, I think, like, one, once you're in the ambulance service, I think the um, the mindset is, like, once you're in there, you're in there. It's like, that's what you do for, like, until you retire, right? And um, for me, it just sort of, I, I always said when I started, like, because you do see, like, people in that job that are burnt out, I was like, I, I never want to get to that point. And I, I got to that point where I was just burnt out from, from you know, 11 years of night shift and seeing all this stuff. Um, I, I was starting to, like, get really burnt out. And I was like, i I, I got to get out of this job, basically. Um, but I didn't, again, like, I didn't have any sort of clear path of what I wanted to do. And, and that, so that kind of kept me there for, I guess, the last couple of years. I was, I was sort of, like, um, 
you know, I would have stopped earlier probably, but I didn't know what to do because that was the mindset. You just stay in that job. Uh, but at the same time, I was dealing with like chronic pain. I had like a failed bilateral um, hip surgery. And, and so for like a large part of um, that career as a paramedic, I was in a lot of pain. And that sort of like got me to start exploring like my own health and ways to get out of pain. Um, because for a lot of years, I, I was stuck in a system of like going to the physio, the chiro, the muscular therapist, the, the hip surgeon. I went to everybody. I've been through that same cycle. You're, you're talking, yeah. you're talking yeah. to the right man. Over and there. I spent a lot of money doing it and I got really confused, uh, really frustrated. The end result for me was having a, this bilateral hip surgery, which was deemed a failed surgery. Um, I got to a point like... I remember the exact sort of moment that I got to this point where um, I got up at like two o'clock in the morning and to get out of bed, like I'd literally like grab my legs and move them over to the side of the bed. That's it. That's the level of like dysfunction that was in my hips and pain. And then I was walking to the toilet like two, three in the morning. I was sort of like holding onto the wall. I'd become so like, fr I'd just become so fragile to be honest. And um, because I was always looking for ways to like not move. And because I thought I was told by a hip specialist, imagine you're on a bike and you're going down a narrow pathway. If you go too far to the right, you fall down. If you go too far to the left, you fall down. That's what he told me. And I went back to my car after that appointment. I was like, fuck it. Just for me, it was like, I got to stop moving. I just got to sit. And like, and so I started doing that a lot and, and stopped moving. And that's where I, I became like, my body became fragile. And I was going to the toilet, holding onto the wall. And I got into the toilet and I was just like, I just sat down on the floor of the toilet. I was like, I mean, I was only like 37. Uh, and I just started crying. I was like, fuck, this is just so gnarly what I'm going through. Um, and it's affecting me, my mental health so much. There's got to be like a way I can't, I was literally at the point where I was like, I can't deal with it anymore. And so that was the point. I woke up that morning. I was like, right, I'm going to solve this problem myself. I'm going to stop relying on other people. And that's when I invested heavily into understanding what was going on in my hips, uh, the muscle imbalance that I'd created around that dysfunction, the effect it had on my nervous system, the effect it had on my breathing, the effect it had on my metab metabolism, the effect it had on my sleep, that there was all these ripple on effects. And because I'd had such a good understanding of the human body and how all these body systems interact, I knew that it wasn't just my hips. There was, it was um, you know, if there's dysfunction in one body system, it affects all body systems. And so I went deep into this learning of like the muscular system and building strength in my hips, but also yeah, regulating my nervous system. And that's where like I learned about the breathing because when you have pain, you tend to like breath hold or breath stack, or you have quite shallow breathing, breathing into your upper chest. And that was actually causing uh, a lot of the pain because it upregulates your nervous system. Um, and so at this, to come back to your question, at this point I was like, trying all of these things, but I'd just go down, really deep down one rabbit hole and the next one and the next one. And I, I got to this point where I was like, right, every time I go deep into like doing something for, for self-betterment, I get better, but not enough. And I got to this point where I was like, man, if I brought all of this stuff together that I've learned, the breathing stuff, the nervous system regulation, the stress mitigation, the, um, the muscle and tissue work, um, I'd get better in leaps and bounds. And that's what I did. And that's why I named my business Integrated Training because it has to be an integrated approach. And um, it was kind of at that point where I started like working with people just out at Piha and just the guy down the road who had back pain or um, I went with a couple of young surfers out there. And it just, yeah, this was just in like the shed uh, at my home, which I ended up calling it Woody's Movement Workshop. And that was initially the name of my business, which everyone just still, still calls it that <laughs> now. Anyway. Um, yeah, and then like, the trajectory from like starting that business to now is for myself has been mind boggling because now I'm working with some of the most elite athletes in the world and not just um, athletes, but um, professionals. And I work with anyone who wants to optimize health and performance, but yeah, the trajectory of the business has just gone like that. And um, the difficult thing there is like when everything happens so quickly, I'm not business orientated. And so I, I had to learn or I've had to learn how to run a business, which, has been challenging. Can we just pause there for a second and reflect back on <clears throat> your initial remarks of being the kid in Auckland Grammar Hall mm. and feeling those feelings to where you are now? And like I've heard you on other podcasts 
speaks so eloquently and so detailed to the point where I'm like, fuck, I need to listen to that again because uh, I, 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 I can't. I, I, I never can't. think that I've talked like that. It's amazing. It's yeah, like it's in your understanding of it all. I just find it fascinating to reflect on maybe what you were feeling when you were in class L mm. versus where you are now is, is fucking phenomenal. Yeah, man, it's taught me like, um, the, like for me, it's just, it's taught me just to like constantly challenge yourself. Because if you're not challenging yourself, you're not going anywhere, right? That's the big, the biggest thing for me is like, it would, it, which like comes back to that travel was just like, I instinctively knew that I needed to just challenge myself constantly. Um, because, you know, in that school, I never challenged myself. I just, it, it, and it wasn't anything that I picked up on. It was, it was just like, I think I came out of that school and I just felt so like just bored and like hadn't been challenged because I'd never tried to just being so uh, hungry to like yeah, really push myself. And, and I'm amazed as well at that, to think about that moment when you're crying on the toilet floor and whatever has flipped in your mind to then go, right, fuck it, I'm all in here. And I wonder, was it fuck it, I'm all in here and I'm going to find out? Or did you have peaks and troughs where you were like, and this isn't working, fuck, maybe I need to go back here, or was it just like, once that, that, that spark was lit, was it just no, it's there? never a linear process, right? Like, you guys know this, like, anything that's worthwhile, it's, and, and like, if you're going to challenge yourself and put yourself out there, it's never a linear process. You're going to be met with all sorts of obstacles and self-doubt, and, like, I still have that now. I mean, I, I still have, like, all of these negative thoughts, self-doubt, uh, I'm not good enough, I'm not ready. I have that every day. But now what I understand about that is that's normal and it's not the thought that matters, it's how you articulate it, how you perceive it and how you respond. Uh, and yeah, that definitely like a big thing for me was, um, you know, like I said to you growing up, in the environment I grew up in, if you push your head, if you put your head up, you got pushed back down. It was like a real thing. I know like we talk about that as Kiwis, but I think amongst the culture I grew up in out at Piha, it was just, it was so like... It still, hap it still happens now. Yeah, and... Um, so like a big thing for me, even starting in the business, like even doing an Instagram and starting posting stuff, I found very challenging. Uh, and even now I do, you know, and, and like even like posting about the athletes I work with, I'm like, oh, people might think I'm a noter or... Um, I mean, we're walking that like, same journey right now. Yeah. And so I've learned, um, and, and like we all do, right, it's just people say like, it's don't care what other people think. It's bullshit. Like we care so much about what other people think of us. Um, and you should care about what other people think, but you should also, I feel like, just go for it, man. Just like don't hold back and put yourself out there. And, and what I've found is the more I put myself out there, you're going to get negative feedback. You get even people that are close to you. And this is what I've found extraordinary is that even people that are close uh, will dig at you. And I just use it now as just feel it's just like, yeah, I, I, I like it. Eh? I'm just like. Yeah, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nail this thing and I'm just going to keep going until it doesn't. It doesn't matter what obstacles are there, but yeah, it definitely hasn't been a linear process. I'm really interested in digging in in the early days <clears throat> when you set up this business or it's a side hustle, Woody's Workshop. Um, to, did you know when you've got all this integrated training, did you know that you had something really special early doors? And when people are coming in and you're getting good results, that must have been quite an amazing feeling. But then link that up to... Cause, Cause, you got Izzy on board early doors, right? Like, it seems like for someone who's new and starting up this new thing, to have like the best in the world at his craft to come on board. Like, how did that link in? That's Israel Adesanya, not Israel Dag. Just, yeah. <laughs> just, for, just for anyone that needed a clarification. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, no, I didn't like when I started the business. It was not my intention to um, even get into like. My intention was like I was very much interested in um, uh, muscle imbalance, and that's that's the sort of the direction I wanted to go in. But once I started working with um, some athletes, I started realizing like that the fundamentals of performance were missing. Um, you know, they were doing all, all lots of good stuff, but the fundamentals around the things that I thought would be like entrenched in team sports and individual pursuits. Um, we're not there and, and this is the stuff around like uh, breathing work and stress mitigation and re recovery and sleep and and um, 
so then I was like, man, there's like a little bit of a niche here that I could get into. Um, and I was found that going down that route of like working with people who had muscle imbalance that um, is very hard to like differentiate yourself in that um, area because it's so flooded with uh, strength and conditioning coaches and muscular therapists and um, and so yeah, it was it's just sort of like evolved and then um, I, I was just like I was into the UFC was so I was just like I want to um, I'm going to get there and train these guys I don't know how but that was like a challenge for me. Um, and so I just started off working with, I, I remember like there was one fighter that I was looking at the gym, the city kickboxing, and there was one fighter, this guy, BJ Bland, um, uh, Quicksand Bland they call him, and he was a, he's a Taranaki boy, um, like, I was like, if I can get him to, uh, to do it, I reckon, because um, he was like, I think just, I, I looking at him from the outside, I was like, uh, that guy's like, he's He's a workhorse, he's quiet, he's sort of, um, uh, I don't know, just sort of, sort of like spotted him out. So I hit him up and um, he was like, oh, no, nah, I'm, I'm uh, you know, sort of said, oh, maybe on the next fight camp. And, uh, and were, were you a member of City Kickboxing Gym? Like, no, no, no. no you just think about oh, it. No. I love it. Um, and, and so he was sort of like, oh, maybe in the next fight camp, And but cheers for your message. Um, and so I was like, hey, all good, man. Um, and then I went away and I sat down and I was like real dejected. I was like, damn it. And I was like, nah, fuck it. I'm going to message him back. I was like, look, man, just come in and do one session. Just one session. It just take 45 minutes. I guarantee you, um, you know, we'll get some good results. And so he came in for that session and then he ended up being the guy that really, um, really vouched for the work. Um, and, and he was such a great advocate for it. Uh, and then so once he started coming, the next guy, and then we, a bunch of Tahitians that fight there started coming, and then before too long, um, yeah, the, the, um, some of the UFC boys started coming. Yeah. Did you realise, and I know, and I've seen interviews before, like you don't like dropping names and you don't perhaps like talking about how specific guys are training under you, but when Israel Adesanya came to you for training, did you realise that was a big moment for your brand and for, for I don't know, the validity of what you do, that someone is trusting you with their process who is at the top of his game? I never actually, I never looked at it like um, what it would do for like my business. I never, never even really like entered my mind. I was just like, right, this is a challenge and I really want to, um, I really want to smash it. Just like any client, you know, like uh, what gets me motivated is like that challenge. I keep talking about it, but that's what gets me motivated and, and for me I just saw it as like a big challenge and yeah I was nervous about it and whatever and but man <clears throat> he's the most down-to-earth humble person right like so it wasn't difficult at all and um, the stuff that we're doing um, whilst like the, uh, the underlying mechanisms are quite um, of, of like nervous system regulation and breathing work and um, mindset training um, you know, whilst it's quite in depth in terms of the underlying mechanisms, the actual exercises are simple and they should be simple. And it's not the exercise, it's how you apply it and it's how you relate to people and, and how you can get on the same level and understand that this guy or girl needs something different from this guy or girl and understanding uh, where they are in their career and what they need and their patterns of behaviour and how that's affecting performance. And so it's just all this understanding of human behaviour which you can't, um, you know, you're not going to get that in a, de a degree or it just comes from like practical experience and understanding humans. Does that, that also must come from some of those travel experiences as yeah. well, right? Because when you're dealing with different cultures and needing to be respectful of other people's beliefs and, and all of that stuff, like it is, as we progress through this episode, it's amazing mm. to see how all of these things have culminated in where you are currently and incredible to think where you will end up. Mm. longer term as well because this is kind of the start of the journey right is that right because you, you've, you've transitioned from athletes into corporates or have brought corporates on or high performing professionals? yeah I, my like big thing at the moment is this calm under pressure workshop which is bringing like a high performance workshop to the general population and my uh, this workshop has sort of evolved out of my frustration with how we are currently dealing with mental health in this country and obviously we're doing some incredible things but uh, there's also like 
this workshop for me is um, I I, I want to bring like a um, a workshop that will teach people like underlying mechanisms so get them to actually understand what stress and pressure and anxiety is because a lot of people have anxiety and a lot of people are stressed out and they don't actually understand what's happening in their bodies unless you understand it you can't apply the skills and then if you don't also have the practical scenarios to be able to like go and practice these skills in the underlying theory um, I, I, I just think like you need all three things you need to understand the underlying theory you need the skills and then you need practical application and that's what this workshop I want to do with this workshop and what we are doing with the, with this workshop myself and my team um, every six weeks in New Zealand we take a small group 20 people through this calm and depression workshop two days and they come out the other side of this workshop um, uh, with a much better understanding of stress and pressure and anxiety and what they're actually going through in their own lives um, through, uh, through teaching them these three things. Is it incredibly individualised? Because I've seen you've worked with Blair Took and Ella Williams and Kaikara France and when these guys come, say they come into your workshop, are you devising a very specific plan for each individual person or is it kind of base ideas which work for everyone? Yeah, the exercises are the same. It's just how you apply them. You can change the variables. It's like, um, I always say like the um, complexities and the simplicity. So it, the exercises might be the same, but how you apply it is totally different from person to person. You can't have the same structure for each person. Uh, it just doesn't work. And, and where you might start one person is totally different from where you might start with another client. Um, and so, yeah, I guess the answer is like, as human beings, we all sort of, uh, you know, when I, especially when I work with people that are anxious or stressed, you can pretty much group about 80% of them into uh, uh, the same category in terms of, uh, you know, some of the symptoms and the way that they uh, have developed patterns based on uh, chronic stress or pressure. But how you actually, um, you know, work and talk with that person and apply the exercise is totally different from person to person. I think that's where like, that's one of the frustrations of like, the current model of like, I mean, we say like, for example, like everyone needs eight hours of sleep. No, they don't. Some people need six, some people need 10. When I was a kid, I needed like 16 hours, you know? You sleep till like 11 o'clock in the morning. And, and um, so it's never like one thing fits all. It's all very individualized. The same with nutrition and, um, and all of these things so that's why you've got to get on on the same level and understand the person does that mean the business is tough to grow because you've got such specialized knowledge on so many different areas and you can see people and you can tell what needs to happen mm. but you can you train other people up to do what you do um i think that's what like well that's the business so um the business is me Mm, yeah. um and so yeah like i have people that um uh, like i'm not a specialist in everything so I, i'm very aware that i have to surround myself with the right people and that's what i'm doing at the moment and we have like um a strength and conditioning guy that's tethered to the business uh who's incredible and then um i have people that help me on the calm under pressure that are um, specialists in their areas of stress mitigation and so yeah, it's just like, I think it's not, they, they're not like in the business, but they're tethered to the business and it's like all about collaborating. Yeah. If, you, if you're not in this space, if you're not collaborating, then you're not getting anywhere because you can't do everything by yourself, right? And, and collaborating is where it is at. Mm. Word of mouth uh, amongst these high profile guys obviously helps you build and grow. Was there a story, did you get involved in German footballers, high level German footballers somehow? Um, no, we, I worked with uh, a player for the German national football team um, and that was like, that's a funny story because um, I was just approached via an email and uh, I, I just really glanced over it and saw something about soccer and agreed to have this um, uh, Zoom call. And so I was sitting there in my beanbag in the lounge sort of slumped down and talking to this guy who was actually a talent scout for um, you know, this big uh, soccer team, German soccer team. And um, so I, about five minutes and I was just like, oh, man, sorry, I, I 
I don't mean to be rude, but um, where are you from? And he's like, we're from the German national football team. And then I sort of like sat up <laughs> in my oh. theme bag. <laughs> what have we got here? <laughs> right. And it's like, oh, how'd you find out about this? And they're like, well, this guy actually like um, looks into all these um, sports to see what different people are doing. And then they saw the pool training that we're doing, the, um, the um, pool-based training that we're doing with the UFC athletes with Israel. And so that's how he sort of linked back to me. That's yeah. what I mean, like that, that high profile stuff. I think Dwayne The Rock Johnson was commenting on Adesanya's breath work after one of his fights, and that relates back to what you've been saying. Like it, it spreads very quickly amongst, <laughs> you know, the, the, the top tier. But can you just, for those, I've, I've listened to you talk through like an hour podcast on the stuff, like it can get really in depth. But for those listening who wonder what they can do better with their breathing, is there some basic guide to what they can improve yeah i think the um i think one like really important thing is to understand that because a lot of us are stressed and under the pump right because we're so busy uh and we have families and we have work commitments and uh, mortgages and all the rest of it and um i think one of the important things to understand is that when you are stressed how much it affects your breathing um and it ends up what ends up happening is the breathing ends up becoming the stressor. If you have a breathing pattern disorder, if you're not breathing in a mechanically efficient way, if you're not, uh, if you don't have good diaphragmatic excursion, so good access to your diaphragm, uh, and you're breathing up into here, the breathing ends up becoming the stress. So we think often think of stress as like external, right? But nowadays, most of the stress is coming from within our minds or our bodies, and so um, when the breathing is off it has a direct or an indirect effect on your nervous system. It keeps your nervous system in what we call an upregulated state or a sympathetic state. So with awareness alone, just being more aware of your breathing, because most people don't even think about it, right? It's just like it's taken care of by the autonomic nervous system. Don't need to think about your breathing. Just like your heart rate, your blood vessel diameter, the digestion of your food, you don't need to think about any of those things. But the breathing's different because you can take conscious control of it. And I think that like um, breathing pattern disorders are way more prevalent than what we think. Way, way more prevalent. And it starts in the insidious pro process that starts when we're young. And uh, one of the key contributors here for wh what I've seen or what I believe is sitting. Um, we're not designed to sit. And when we sit, we don't sit upright like this. What do we do? We slunch like that. And we start compressing Yeah, these important... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> organs and muscles like the lungs and the diaphragm these, these are key like organs and muscles that sit right here and when we compress them the body is just an adaptive machine so it starts going right it's getting a, a bit too difficult let's shift the breathing up into here and then you add to that as a kid you look at your superheroes and how they breathe well they all breathe up into here so our mind muscle connection to our lungs or how we breathe is through to up here uh, you then as you go through life you start adding stress to that stress directly affects your breathing rate and depth um, and so you start having this insidious effect and, you, you, I mean, you add in things like childhood asthma or developing pneumonia and that affects your breathing. So there's all these things related to stress because this sitting is stress. Like my back is sore right now. I'm, I'm compressing the muscles, so. uh, yeah, <laughs> the muscles, ligaments, tendons, neural tissue that's running down the back of my legs. I'm just sitting on it, compressing it. I'm just leveraging off my lower back. This is like complacent adaptation and we are adapting to, the, to these things that are, um, so the stress is now not external, it's very much internal based on this like complacent adaptation. I don't know if I'm waffling on or if that makes sense. No, but. no, it does. Um, I was very interested in you as a guest for personal reasons because my story echoes yours in an incredible way. Uh, I had a football injury, which basically meant I couldn't pick my kids up for about two years and I went on this journey and I saw chiropractors and surgeons and physios and did Pilates and all these things and no one could have an answer. I had some degenerative disc issues, but no one could really explain why I couldn't bend over. And the same way you described that you're on the toilet, I, getting out of a car, I would have to lift my legs up and push People them People don't aside. believe it when I tell them that. Eh? I'm like, I literally had to like grab my legs and pull them over the side of the bed. That's how like junked up my head. Chronic pain, big cloud over my life. And I didn't realize how bad it was once you're in it. When you're in it, you, it's not until you're out of it that you realize how bad things were. And then it wasn't until I saw, I went to the back clinic in Hamilton, this Nicola 
at the Black Clinic. Amazing. Nicola, and, you legend. And she just said, I, I just want to watch you move. And I sat down in a chair and I got up and she said, do you realize you hold your breath every time you get up? Do you realize that all of your breathing is in your chest? Like try try breathing in your diaphragm, try opening up. And I did that and I walked up and down and it was a game changer. In weeks, I was back to running again and it was all to do with my breathing, something which yeah. had been overlooked by so many professionals. And I was just amazed at nothing else had changed except my breathing and all of a sudden I was back playing football yeah, again. Yeah, now, now in um, hindsight, how, do you ever look back and realise like that you were like clenching your jaw and you were holding your breath like when you're driving, you're ramming your foot down into the floor and you're just so tense? And Absolutely, I was tense with everything, yeah. tense with everything. Um, yeah. where, where the connection with that, like the breathing and pain, where that came for me was like I was in the car driving to Napier and I was listening to a podcast, a lady called Dr. Belisa Ranich, incredible um, understanding of breathing mechanics. Uh, and she was talking about how you could use your breathing to like calm the nervous system and to um, uh, get rid of pain. And she took, well, she, she was talking about it. She was like, try this breathing technique. So I was in the car, like tense, because I, I literally feel like I was sitting on glass and, you know, real tense. Um, and then so I did this breathing for like five minutes and five, ten minutes. And then after this breathing, I just had no pain. I was just sitting there like, oh, my God, there's something like incredible. And I just, it all just clicked for me around how the breathing was actually keeping my nervous system because I was like breath holding, breath stacking, breathing up into here, a terrible like breathing up into here. And, um, and then I became like, just so consciously aware of what my breathing was doing when I was at rest, when I was uh, exercising, when I was stressed, when I was in pain, and I'd always come back to this breathing technique um, where it, this breathing technique is just really basic. It's like a four or five second inhale through your nose, expanding laterally at the rib cage here, relaxing the chest and shoulders, and when you exhale, you relax. Uh, and you'd do that for a couple of minutes whenever I was aware that my breathing was off. And it took me a long time, I'm talking months, to actually recalibrate my breathing. Um, and that got me so interested around breathing mechanics and how we're actually talking about this stuff. Because mm. if you listen, how we're talking about breathing, we're talking about breathing into your belly. And what does that mean? Like you could not, uh, there could be not a more confusing um, analogy for breathing, breathing into your belly. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. You, you can. I can subscribe to that. I hear it all the time. I don't know what the fuck it means. <laughs> <laughs> I genuinely don't. But and, and so what I've, and people in the space are starting to do now is bring breathing into a high performance environment. And when we talk about breathing, we don't talk about breathing into your belly. We talk about getting better access to your diaphragm, better diaphragmatic excursion. What does the diaphragm look like? How does it move? When it moves, what does the rib cage do? Why does the stomach push out when you breathe in. The stomach pushes out when you breathe in because when you breathe in, the diaphragm drops down into the abdominal cavity. That's a closed cavity. The organs have to go somewhere, so the organs push out this way. So it's not about pushing your belly out when you breathe. If you push your belly out when you breathe, your diaphragm's barely moving. Mm. You're just pushing your guts in and out. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I, yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, and so um, we've just got to be right with the terminology, uh, and that's I'm very... Um, big on that is getting the terminology right so that people actually understand because nothing will work if you don't understand it nothing's ever going to work if you don't understand it i will not do something you tell me to do unless i understand it so i spend a lot of time with my clients explaining to them the underlying uh, uh, principles and mechanisms of what we're doing and why we're doing it and the research related to it or the science related to it so that they can take it and apply it the skills in, in a more sophisticated way the, the, the guys, uh, sorry, the, the people out there who listened to this podcast in the very early days will know I was a big Wim Hof enthusiast. Mm. And I feel like he really put breathing on the map, certainly mm. for me. And I was a diehard Wim Hof breather. And I thought the Wim Hof breathing was something that I would always do. So I did the breathing and I did the cold showers. And it's the cold immersion which is stuck. I don't do the Wim Hof breathing anymore for whatever reason. But I do the cold showers every morning. Every, every shower is a cold yeah. shower. And I know that's part of what you do as well. So yeah. how does that link in? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've done the Wim Hof breathing as well. I don't, it's not something I do either. The, um, I think they call it like, there's a whole bunch of different names for it, cyclic hyperventilation or 
Tumo breathing, uh, that rapid breathing. And um, I do actually enjoy it when I do do it. I'll often do it before, if I do do it, I'll do that type of breathing before doing some calming breathing. Um, the reason for that is sometimes if you create stress, it then allows you to get more calm, if that makes sense. And for a lot of people uh, who you tell to go and sit down and meditate, that will agitate them. Uh, and actually for those people, what they might need is to go for a run first or do some rapid breathing, some form of stress, to then be able to relax. Um, what was the question? Well, just the <laughs> cold, cold immersion. The cold immersion cold. is a part of it, which has actually stuck with me, yeah. and I, I find the benefits so, of it incredible. But I wondered how you incorporate that into what you do. Yeah. Someone sent me an article on cold water immersion the other day, a research article saying that cold water immersion had no uh, benefit for muscle recovery at all. And uh, and so why the question was, like, why are you doing this stupid thing? Why are you sitting in these ice tubs? And I get this all the time. Uh, and, and the researchers are saying, you know, you're better off just to do some foam rolling or relax on the couch. If we're talking about recovery, the most potent form of recovery is being able to regulate your nervous system, being able to shift from an energized into a calm state. So for the ice bath, for what I use it for, for myself and, and for the people that I work with, is let's get you into a really stressed state, a, what we call a sympathetic dominant state, where your nervous system's upregulated, your heart rate's up, your blood pressure's up, you're in that red zone and how calm can you get. So that's directly training your nervous system. How good are you at shifting from being uncomfortable and in pain and stressed to being nice and calm? And with the ice bath, you see incredible results when you use that as part of the practical setting for stress mitigation um, and teaching people that, oh, actually, you can get in there and use your breathing uh, and use these skills and actually get really calm. And when you get people that are depressed, uh, have severe anxiety, what those people tend to do is they create safety barriers, right? Comfort barriers. And so the idea of them, for them getting in the ice bath is like terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. Why would you do that? If you had a negative relationship with stress, why would you want to create more stress? And you get those people in there and you teach them how to control that environment, they get out and it's like a, a, a switch has gone off. It's like, you know, if, if I can control that, I can apply that to these other things in life. And you see massive shifts in people that use this uh, cold water immersion um, for stress mitigation. But also like, the, you know, the flood of endorphins when you get out, the adrenaline, the noradrenaline. We, we often think that adrenaline is like the stress hormone it is, but adrenaline is incredible for your immune function. And when you get out of the cold water, you have a huge amount of noradrenaline, which is adrenaline for your brain, which makes you more focused. That's why you get out and you're sort of like pumped and you're, you feel on, right? And then because you've achieved it, you also get a hit of, um, of uh, what, what do they call the um, dopamine. dopamine yes. And it's the combination of dopamine and dr adrenaline that gives you that really uh, euphoric, amazing feeling when you get out of the ice bath. And so if we're just looking at the research and we're saying, uh, hey, this is doing nothing for muscle recovery, we were missing, like, we're just looking at these superficial layers of, there's, so this, this is much more um, than muscle recovery this is actually learning how to recover in terms of your nervous system there's also the goggins element to it as well of doing something that sucks and overcoming just something that yeah generally sucks yeah i, I got mates who like i got one mate who's got the size tub and he, he gets in it at like five in the morning and i'm like i wouldn't do that i don't want to do that i don't want to be in there at five in the morning but he gets in there um and i'm sure it has incredible benefits for him and if you if you're doing something and you believe it's good for you it is going to be good for you. It doesn't even matter if it's kind of shitty for you because that, that's the placebo effect. The placebo effect is incredible. I feel like this has been the best ad for your practice ever. You're going to get our listeners <laughs> coming to you. I, I can guarantee it. Um, I actually want to read something. We reached out to someone who's been to one of your workshops and wanted to hear from him what he said about it. And he said, um, this is from Simon Gower. He said, hey, Dave's the man. I spent three days with him. It was a massive eye-opener. Dave is incredibly in tune with the mind and body. He had me sussed out pretty much as soon as we started, but waited a couple of hours to sit down and talk to me about what he's observed. 
Some things I was aware of, but others I wasn't. It related to the way I moved, my breathing, carrying tension, stress, mindset. Individually, they weren't massive, but when you start putting all of those issues together, it has a massive effect on the way you move and the way you feel. I used to think stress was not being able to handle your shit, but Dave exposed me to how I was constantly keeping my mind and body in a stress, sympathetic state to try and get shit done. I had no idea that was even a thing, but once you understand it, you can start to control it, which is fucking powerful stuff. He's a cool guy, real too. Um, the, the, the question I wanted to ask from that is some amazing feedback, but can you size people up as soon as you see them? How, how, have you been sizing me and Shay up as we're talking? Like, Can you tell where we're carrying stress or what we can improve pretty early? Yeah, you can. You can, um, you can definitely tell. Like, I, <clears throat> I think that's like uh, one of the things that I am very good at is... Um, being able to suss people out uh, and you can pick up on ingrained patterns of behavior especially um, so so like that's that was um that was very cool by the way I, I really like Simon we spent yeah three days out at Piha and it was incredible um, because he was so invested in it um, which motivated me but with all of the stuff, what you're looking for is patterns of behavior, subconscious patterns of behavior. These patterns are based on our practical experiences of life, normally traumatic events that happen. We all go through traumatic events, and in the acute phase after going through a traumatic event, you, you put safety barriers right up to like protect you. The problem is when once the threat has gone or you've moved on, a lot of people hold on to those patterns to keep them safe going forward, right? And... You see this, I see this, I can identify this in myself, my partner, my friends, the people I work with, and it's about going back and getting them, and the best way to um, bring these patterns to the forefront is in stress and pressure situations because you will always go back to your hardwired patterns. Uh, and that's why when we do, for example, the Calm Under Pressure workshop, we're working with guys like Simon, the very first thing I do with them is get them down on the beach and we run the sand dune. Because you will see these patterns, they're so clear. Um, you know, these patterns of not quite running, getting to the top and turning around before getting to the top or getting, seeing them get stuck in their mind halfway through the sand dune and latching onto the end or like uh, the body language and even, even like the breathing and how they recover at the end. It's all, um, it's all like very telling in these practical um, settings. And then, yeah, you know, just talking to people. And um, I think like... When you're dealing with someone who's in that corporate environment, you know that the stress, they're going to be stressed, even if they don't realise it, because we're not designed to do that. We're not designed to look at screens. We're not designed to sit there for eight hours a day. We're not designed to deal with all these 100 different things that are going on at once, the mortgage, the family, the, the work pressure. And when we talk about stress and anxiety, people are like, oh, no, I'm not stressed or I'm not anxious. But when you start looking at their patterns and getting them to understand that being anxious is not like cowering in the corner, Things like uh, perfectionism, a, for, a form of anxiety. Um, and, and we have like a whole list of these things. And you, someone that said, I don't have anxiety, and you go through this list and they're like, yeah, I, I have that, I have that, I have that, I have that. Well, you know, these, these are signs and symptoms of uh, stress overload and anxiety. I feel like this has given a pretty awesome window into what you do. And for those who want more information will direct you to the websites and, and things later. Um, I did want to ask about how you deal with stress. You, you had an Instagram story or video a while back about a keynote speech you were about to do and you made a comment about how you were quite sort of nervous mm -hmm. and I don't know if you used the word stressed out for it but how you reflected on it afterwards. What do you do when you are in a situation when you get stressed out? Yeah, what I've found is like big things don't stress me out uh, but little things... Um, things that probably shouldn't can sometimes compound. Um, I think, like, for me, I've realised that, like, if I just keep pushing and I just keep going and, um, and don't actually recover, the stress starts spilling over into, I guess, like, I guess I've worked it out as I've gone along. For me, what works for me in terms of mitigating stress and pressure, and it's a combination of things. It's not it's not any one thing. It's a combination of making sure I'm sleeping right, making sure I'm getting like good quality sleep, 
uh, making sure that I exercise every day, making sure that I'm eating nutritious. The five pillars of health. If you're not doing that and, and you're looking for anything, if you haven't nailed the five pillars of health, and you're looking for all these other ways of mitigating stress and pressure, you're never going to get it right. Get the uh, five pillars of health right first. Just remind me what those five pillars are or <laughs> yeah. some of the listeners that might not be aware of them. <laughs> yeah. Exercise. Tick. Social interaction. Tick. Nutrition. <laughs> uh, sleep. Fluid mm-hmm. intake. Yeah. Uh, there's one other. I can't remember what it is. But they're just the basic things, the things that your parents told you when you were a kid. Get those right. Get those squared away uh, because if you're adding all this other fancy stuff and you don't have the foundations right, um, yeah, you're always going to be. And, and nowadays, like, I think the biggest thing is we're all so busy, so trying to fit this stuff in, but you have to find a way. And, yeah, we all say we're busy, but a lot of us are just busy up here and we're spending so much time burning energy because this thing is just going... And, and we do, like, one thing with the clients I work with, which is non-negotiable, is, like, 20 minutes of focus work every day where you are just, uh, I guess, like, for lack of a better word, meditation. And people are like, 20 minutes? There's no way I can do 20 minutes. And I'm like, look on your phone. How many hours are you spending on your phone every day? And, like, actually doing 20 minutes of this is going to make you way more productive. You're going to go into a battle of work with better focus. Your nervous system is going to be regulated. You're going to be more creative. Um, so it's, yeah, for me it's a combination of just all of these things, like getting the foundations right, but then adding in, um, you know, the breathing work, the meditation, um, which like I try to do every day and I'm pretty consistent with it, um, you know, making sure I am um, dim the lights at night, I'm not on my screen until I go to bed, you know, I, I'm doing, I always think of like, okay, what were we doing like a few hundred years ago? We went on Instagram at 10, 11 o'clock at night. Um, and the times I feel best, like I've just come off a two uh, ten day camping trip, and we went up uh, far north. We got, a little, we got a little camper van, me and my partner, and we go up there and we stay in this campground in Hohora, and then we just jump off to the beaches, Henderson's Rawa, uh, and then when the west coast, we go over ninety mile beach, we drive up to the bluff, and ten days of just doing that. And um, the, there's no reception, limited reception up there, but anyway, I just put the phone away I give myself maybe like 20 minutes a day to check the thing um, and in that 10 days I come out of that and I'm reset mm. I feel absolutely incredible and then I get back into work and I feel that uh, stress and pressure start building back up so what I know now is like you have to regulate the stuff during the day it's no good to be like right I'm going to switch off at night it doesn't work like that because your body is preparing for battle all day you're going this way that way You're you, your, your body doesn't understand the difference between like uh, your nervous system doesn't understand the difference between all these stresses, like someone pull, pull, pulling in front of you in the car, and back in the day we were hunting or going into battle. It's the same thing. So if you're preparing for battle all day, don't expect to sleep at night. And the hallmark of chronic stress is when it spills over into your sleep. So for me, I've been through all this stuff. I've been stressed out. I've been anxious. I've been like, um, I've been through all of it, and it's all for me. All this stuff is like I. I even still now like slip up and, and, and I'll, let, I'll, I'll fall off the wagon and get, you know, like burn it too hard and push too hard with the work and that and get stressed. But I know now like what to come back to, which is these, make sure you got the pillars right, introduce these incredible things that we have access to, meditation, whatever it might be, going for a walk on the beach and then resetting. The big one for me is resetting like this camp trip. Um, you've met, you've referenced a couple of times now, like the natural environment, the beach at Piha, getting mm. away, surfing. You use water a lot. Like, how important is is that to you personally? The the environment that we that we kind of operate in. Uh, it is absolutely everything. So I have um, I work with uh, a lot of the work that I'm doing now is with clients abroad, um, and I work with this. One, I, I ask all my clients the same thing an entire week. So I'll ask you guys and the listeners are the same, an entire week, how many times would your bare foot touch the earth's surface? And so this guy that's sitting there on the other side of the screen in, um, in uh, New York, he sat there and he thought about it and he looked at me and he said, never. He said, an entire week, my foot never touches the earth's surface. Do you think, without even like uh, having to understand the science behind uh, grounding and how important it is for the 100 muscles, ligaments and tendons in your foot to actually grip the earth's surface, uh, do you actually think that that's normal and healthy to not be connected with the earth? 
and, and people come out to Piha and they go for a walk on the beach and they're in their shoes. And I'm, I'm just looking at this and these are kids that are just like, <laughs> I think it's just mind boggling how we've got to this point. Absolutely mind boggling. Um, and, and just from a musculoskeletal perspective, if your foot and ankle is not strong, you're going to have back pain. You're going to have issues with your knees. You're going to have issues with your back. It's all connected. Uh, and there's, um, you know, think of a bridge, right? And the shape underneath the bridge is an arc. Why is it an arc? Obviously, you let water or traffic through, but it's an arc to strengthen the structure. Well, where is that arc in your body? Where is the, the, that, uh, that arc is in your foot, right? And if that arc is weak, the whole body is weak. doesn't matter how many core exercises you do or whatever else you're doing. Um, and so connecting back, it's not only about connecting back and how calming it is to connect back to nature, how calming that is for your nervous system, but it's also um, how good it is for, uh, for every part of your body, you know. Is there a spirituality element to what you do, like in terms of connection with the earth, or is that just convenient kind of connection there no nah, there's definitely like a spirituality aspect like um especially with like surfing i mean you're out it can't not be you're in the ocean um which is so powerful especially out at pH, you got the waitakere ranges you got the black iron sand and you got the tasman sea there's a melting pot of energy that's why that's why i run this workshop out there people come out there and they feel that energy um and then you're sitting out there and the sun goes down and you're the only one in the ocean and, and it, Know, it's the middle of winter and there's no one around like it's crazy it's like that's like um for me that is how like i reconnect and how i recharge and everyone has to find their way of doing that but it has to be there has to be an element of reconnecting back into nature there um uh, man we live in new zealand like the stuff is right on our doorstep there's so much depth here. I feel like we could talk for hours, but I am going to attempt to start wrapping us up. There was one thing that was in my notes. Is it true you're a manifester and that there were uh, people when you started this journey that you told yourself or wrote down or whatever that you would work with one day that you have worked with? And the next question is, who is next on the list, if you're able to say that? Yeah, I, I definitely believe in manifesting. Because what is manifesting? You're just all you're doing is telling. It's just your internal dialogue, right? You're just telling yourself uh, what you want to happen, or, or what you can foresee happening, and that's incredibly powerful. The story you tell yourself is everything. So yeah, I manifest all the time, and it's almost uncanny. Some of the things that I've manifested that happen, it like it blows me. It blows my mind, and um, I, 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 I'm not going to say who it was, but. I was working with one client, this is like back when I first started uh, Woody's Movement Workshop in, in my garage at Piha, and he was coming in and I said to him, man, this is what I'm going to do. And he looked at me like I was mad. Because at that point it was just a, literally a shed, like it had my tools in it and, and the lawnmower and uh, you know, put some flooring down, had my sign up and I was just like, and I just, I, I don't even know why I told him because I normally wouldn't do that, but I told him and he just looked at me like I was mad and then I remember when it happened, um, he messaged me and he's like, holy shit, man, I remember you saying that in the garage. And yeah. I thought, and, and, and like, he's just, just like, now it's like, fucking, it, it's happened. And I was like, man, you just like, you manifest the stuff, but that's not enough, right? Like you had to say, oh, I'm going to manifest something that's going to happen. Then you got to go and make it happen. So, but yeah, I think the um, internal story that we're telling, I'm very aware of like the story I tell myself and like, you know, I'll have all sorts of fucked up thoughts that come in and um, all sorts of crazy weird weird stuff, but it doesn't, it never agitates me because I know that's normal and I bring that thought in, change the language, shift my perspective and respond in a creative way. That's like, I think that is one of the most powerful things you can do is have the ability to bring this stuff in, not push it away and be fearful of like how crazy these thoughts or whatever whatever's going on. You bring it in, you articulate it and, and, and perspective is everything. Like if you've got a hundred different ways of looking at something, then you've got lots of options. Um, and so that's, yeah, part of like that whole manifesting. Casting forward, looking five years into the future, would would the goal be working exclusively with some of the world's best performers in different areas, or would it be more helping the every man, or would it be a bit of a mix? No, it'd absolutely be both. Like, I, I want to work with like top tier athletes, but I want to work with the guy down the road who's like, I just want to work with people who are invested in self betterment, 
and and who like I get really excited working with a client when I just ask them, you know, what, what are you here for? And they tell they 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 they're like, man, I just want to be, uh, you know, I just want to like get healthier or whatever it might be. And they have a challenge. I'm like, oh yeah, okay, I'm in I'm in on that. You know, like I'm not definitely like um, not here to like motivate people. If anything, it's like. Um, I will put in 100% effort if you put in 100% effort, and that's how it should be. That's how, like, any time that you work with someone, that's how it should be, and I'm pretty selective of who I work with. Um, but, yeah, it's not not I want to be working with just um, athletes. I want to just work with, uh, you know, anybody that's willing to invest in their own uh, and optimising their own health. Shay, I'm going to start teeing you up for the outro, so I'm just going to say my bit first. Um, Dave, I love this episode and I love the way that it's played out that the listeners have heard of the real life experiences and the struggles you've been through and the hardships and the different life journeys and it's culminated in this amazing place you are now working with the top athletes in the world and the everyman and helping everyone come together it's it's so cool uh so thank you so much for coming in and giving us your time and sharing a few beers but I'm not the outro guy that's Shay Okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, <clears throat> like a cathar- this is a cathartic experience, right? And I, ha- I felt the same. I've been a- I-, I say this for a lot of the episodes. Like I felt like I've been a passenger in this one because I'm captivated by your story and by what you have to say. Your story, not only f- for how entertaining it is from the-, the experiences that you've had, but also you said you weren't trying to motivate people, but how motivating it is as well. Like I cherry pick lots of these different ideas that I hear and want to integrate them into my life but the fact that you've aggregated these things and turned it into something that can help top athlete and everyday person as well is phenomenal Um, the element and the connection back to earth and the environment is something that I think more people need to do Mm. and more people need to get involved with Um, and that you're so passionate and articulate articulate Fuck, articulate. <laughs> Killed it. Passionate and, art- and art- articulate about what you do as well. And I can't get beyond thinking about that kid at Auckland Grammar, mm. thinking that they weren't good enough or they didn't fit in or they didn't have a purpose to where you are now and what you have the potential to do to, to people's lives is absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Thank you. I've, I've been lucky to like be surrounded by a good family and good friends uh, and... Um, what I was going to say is, like, I would not normally come on and talk about um, a lot of the stuff, and I've not in any podcast or any interview talked about, like, my travels and things like that. It's always been about, like, the performance side of things. Um, I think, like, what you guys are doing and just going on to your Instagram and, and looking at the um, uh, the clips on there, it made me want to come in and talk about that stuff because um, it's down to earth. It's like you're both, uh, you know, good buggers. And, um, yeah, it just made me want to come in and, and share that stuff. So, yeah, thanks. And, and um, I really appreciate it. That was, that was, that was going to be my other point is that you're just a normal dude <laughs> with, with super abilities. But the fact that you've rode in from Piha, Piha's your home, like I am and like Steve is, we're ambassadors. We're super proud of where we grew up and where we come from. It's the same for you. Like you've mm. taken it all around the world wherever you've been and you've gravitated back to where it feels like home. And the yeah. fact that you're, yeah, and you're proud to take people out there and, and connect them with that is fucking awesome. Man. Yeah, I am very proud of being from PR. When people ask me where I'm from, I never say Auckland, I'm like, I'm from PR. Yeah. And they're like, isn't that in Auckland? I'm like, no, it's, it's on the West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll let you get back out to PR and we'll come and visit you one day soon. Yeah, cheers, lads. Thank you very much. Cheers, Dave.